Amen. Now let's just turn in our Bibles once again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to read from the verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Find the place. We'll commence the reading. Remember, we're reading God's Word, reading, of course, from the authorized version. And it's always right and proper that we carry our Bibles with us and we turn to the place and we see the words from themselves. <coughs> the late Pastor Willie Mullen, who used to preach in Lurgan and other places, he used to always emphasize look at the book. Look at the book. <coughs> and that's what we want you to do today, to, to look at the book. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. We pray that God will indeed stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this morning is taken again from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and 23. And my subject today is Paul's prayer for the believer's entire sanctification. Now last week I began to look at this verse of scripture thinking primarily about the context. And we preached last Lord's Day under the heading the counsel and comfort in light of Christ's coming. And I pointed out to you that the theme of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 is the comfort and counsel of the church in light of the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Paul believed in the second coming of Christ. If you look at our text, it says, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a reference to his second return. And Paul is urging them. He's comforting and counseling them despite their many fears, despite their worries, despite their anxieties, despite their concerns, even about their loved ones who have died, he's saying, in light of Christ's return, this is what I want you to do. I want you to live for Jesus Christ. I want you to love Jesus Christ. I want you to be loyal to him. I, I want you to, to lean heavily upon Christ. Now, as we looked at the wider context, we discovered the expression of God's will for his people. And I pointed out the word and in verse 23. I told you that it was a, a conjunction. Uh, and we took this first word and we linked it into the wider context. And we asked the question, what is God's will for his people? 
And we pointed out that God's will is clear and concise. And from this passage of scripture, we said God's will for his people was to be joyful, for we are to rejoice evermore. God's will for his people is to be prayerful, we're to pray without ceasing. God's will for his people is to be thankful, because in everything we're to give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We said it's God's will for his people to be mindful, were to quench not the spirit. We can do that even as Christians. We, 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 we pointed out that God's will for his people is to be faithful, were not to despise prophesying, especially the preaching of the word of God. And we applied that. And we said that God's will for his people is to be truthful. They're to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And we said that it's God's will for his people to be holy. Remember we linked it up with 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now that is still the theme for today. In light of Christ's return, be holy. Be entirely sanctified. You see, this is what Paul prays for. Listen again to verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's thinking about Christ's return. And he's thinking about the need for counsel and comfort for God's people. And he's saying to them, look, in a practical way, this is God's will for you. And it's God's will that you're entirely sanctified. And he prays for them that they will be entirely sanctified until Jesus returns, or until we're received home to glory. Now I said to you last week that we had only, when we had begun, scratched the surface. And I hadn't really planned this morning to preach again on this subject. But I felt that because we'd only scratched the surface, and it was so important that we understood the text, that, that I've decided to, in a sense, take a, a second look at it. Notice three things about this prayer. Think of the essence of sanctification. He says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now you just look at the words, sanctify you wholly. We'll answer the question in a moment, what is sanctification from our shorter catechism. But just think of the word sanctify. What does that word mean? It's a biblical term. Now, when you read it in your Bible, what's the sense in your mind? I want to point out, without getting into the etymology of words, that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the verb, because that's what it is, sanctify, it means to cut or it means to set apart or it means to separate. And the clear concept and the clear thought of believers is that they are being set apart, they are separated unto, or they're cut out from the world unto the Lord. And we were thinking there of that lovely hymn that we sang, Psalm, or hymn 500, Take the world, but give me Jesus. How can a man say that? And here's the answer, he's been cut out from the world. And he's been set apart unto the Lord. And he's separated from the world. And he's consecrated to the Lord. Sanctify you. That, that, that word you is a reference to the born again believer. The people of God. Those who are genuinely and truly saved. Paul is praying for Christians. Notice the word holy. It's spelt W-H-O-L-E. 
L-Y. And it's only used amazingly this one time in the whole of the New Testament. And what does it mean? It means through and through. Sanctify you through and through. And Paul says, and remember this is a prayer for sanctification of believers that affects every part of their being. And that, folks, is the essential meaning here. Paul is praying for the sanctification of believers that affects every part of their being. What is sanctification? We'll answer from the catechism. Question 35. And of course, probably when maybe some of you here learnt the catechism, it meant probably nothing to you. You just were learning words because that was the done thing. Sunday school teacher said, the, the Sunday school superintendent said, mum or dad said. But later on in life, the, these things maybe become a little clearer as to the benefit of them. Sanctification, we're told in our catechism, is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die on the sin and live on the righteousness. And as I pointed out at the end last week, notice it's a work of God's free grace. It proceeds from God's undeserved grace and mercy to us. It's the opposite of justification. Justification is an act, not a work. Justification is something that takes place instantaneously, something that's complete, something that's irreversible. Just Justification is being legally declared righteous as far as our standing before God is concerned. It's our entitlement to heaven. But sanctification is the work of God's free grace. Notice making a person holy is a work. It's a progressive work. It's not all at once. It's something that is gradual, that's rolled out over a person's life span from the moment they get saved to the moment they die and enter glory. Notice it's a work wrought within us from first to last by God's Holy Spirit because it's a work of God. Notice it consists in our being made like to God. Gradually being weaned away from sin, learning to, to hate sin more and more, to, to die unto it, to, to treat sin as if it was dead to you, to, 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 to love and practice holiness and right living more and more. Notice it's called a renewing because it restores us to the state that we first had in Adam. Notice it's a reference to the whole man. The entire man. Let me read it again. Sanctification is a work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God. The entire man. The spirit, the soul, and the body. And I want to point out this morning that sanctification is an integral part of God's salvation. John Newton Rightly said, and John Owen, all whom God justifies, that's legally declared righteous on the ground of the death and blood shedding of Jesus Christ, all whom God justifies, he sanctifies. That is, he cuts out from the world and he sets them apart from himself and he separates them unto himself and he works in them. On the same ground and basis, the ground of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and fits and enables those believers to enter heaven. And as we pointed out in closing, it's not a reference to sinless perfection. There's no such thing as ever reaching a state of sinless perfection this side of heaven. There's no such thing as a believer reaching a state where he cannot sin or his sin is 
totally eradicated. Don't beat yourself up. I told you last week uh, uh, about a, uh, a young man in the faith mission along with me who beat himself up over this particular issue uh, and ended up in a, an institution over the head of it and has never been the same since uh, and lost out completely with God because he got it into his head. He could reach a state where, where he could never sin. Now there are preachers and there are people who point to this text of scripture and others and say, here's a message on sinless perfection. I've, I've heard men preach on sinless perfection from this text. Call it whatever they want, a clean heart, second blessing. Uh, what they mean is you can be saved on this particular day. That is justified. And a year from that date, or 20 years from that date, you could reach a point where you're sanctified at a given moment, never to sin again. And I want to tell you this morning, don't beat yourself up, because there's no such teaching in the Bible. And this verse is not teaching sinless perfection. You see, sanctification begins at the moment you're born again of the Holy Spirit. And as I've been suggesting from the meaning sanctify, you're cut off from the world to be different. You're set apart to be the Lord's. You're sanctified in the sense that you're separated now and you're consecrated to the Lord to be like Christ. And as we learn from the catechism, sanctification not only begins at the moment of the new birth, but it's a progressive work. And it continues right up to the point when a believer dies or Jesus Christ comes again and takes his soul and, uh, and spirit into heaven. And let me point out to you that we can be full of resolve to be holy. And we ought to be. We ought to strive to do better. And yet the truth is that that resolve, if it's by our own strength and power to do better, often fades and falls by the wayside. And many believers are not only full of resolve, but they're full of regret. They feel a failure. And many times I've felt a failure, felt discouraged and wanted to quit and said, but I've made too many mistakes. I've, I've sinned in this way. I've, I've sinned in that way, Lord. And of course we're conscious that Yes, well, we're full of responsibility. I've got to do this because this is God's will. It's not what the Bible says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God wants me to be holy. God wants me to be different, separate from the world, consecrated to him. And while I've got this responsibility and got this resolve in my head, I need to do this. We, we often feel, but we're full of regret at the same time. Because I can't do it. And that's right. You can't do it by your own strength and by your own power. You see, we need the Lord. And the Bible tells us it is God that worketh in you both to do and to will of his own good pleasure. Think of the context. Look, look at the context. Look at your Bible now. As Willie Mon suggested. Look at the book. Verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you. See, you can just imagine when the believers read this letter in the church, this is what Paul's praying for. He's praying for believers to be entirely sanctified. We could never do that. We could never live like that. How is that possible? Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Yes, we've got a responsibility, but we need the Lord. We need absolute trust and reliance in him. We'll never be holy. We'll never hate sin. We'll never love righteousness. We'll never be like the Lord Jesus in our own power and by our own inward ability and strength. You see, God's work is to work holiness within us. And he put the principle of holiness within us the moment we're born again. And it's God who works in us to sanctify us, cut us out from the world, separate us unto himself. And that's what it is. I, I'm thinking of the, the hymn writer here. and um, Holiness by faith in Jesus, not by effort of thine own. Sin's dominion crushed and broken by the power of grace alone. God's own holiness within thee. 
his own beauty on thy brow. This shall be thy pilgrim brightness. brightness. This sh- thy blessed portion. Now, you see, that's the key. Holiness by faith in Jesus, not by effort of thine own. Sin's dominion crushed and broken by the power of grace alone. Now, now that's the essence of sanctification. Quickly and secondly, I want you to think of the experience now of sanctification. We've got the expression, this is the will of God. We've got the essence now in our mind, hopefully, of what it is. Now, now think of the experience of it. He says, if we look at the text, and the very God of peace sanctify you, circle that word you, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice in the second part of the verse, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Note the order. Now, now does that stand out to you? What does he mention first in the prayer? I pray God your whole spirit. Do do you see that? And soul and body be preserved blameless. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit, and this is for the benefit of the theologians that are here, and there are one or two, and I know that you're going to say to me um, certain things. And you're probably thinking them already. Is... The composition of man, are we a tripartite being or are we a bipartite? And for those who don't know what tripartite is and bipart is, don't worry about it. All right. Okay. A tripartite being is someone who has three parts, soul or spirit, soul and body. And there are those theologians that say, but there's other verses that just mention soul and body. And there's a big argument. Is the constitution of man made up of three parts or two parts? And there are two verses in the Bible where it suggests it's three parts. And there's many verses in the Bible where it just mentions soul and body. But I'm not going to get into that argument this morning. And don't you get into the argument. Right? Because we're not getting into that discussion. And I don't think that Paul would want us even in the prayer to get into the discussion. He's thinking of two things. The inward man... (coughs) And the outward man. What man is inwardly and what man is outwardly. That's the order. And what does he start? He starts with man inwardly. Remember, he's writing to believers. You. (laughs) You. The whole man is sanctified by the triune God. That's the subject of the verse. That's the issue. That's the theme. And when God works this work, he starts with the inward man. The Lord works first on the inside. And then he works on the outside. That which affects the outward man. Let me illustrate that if I can. Whenever the Lord was laying out the details for the erection of the temple... And I said this down in Oma when we were dealing with the tabernacle. Do you know that he starts with the interior? When he revealed the details to Moses, you know the first thing he mentioned? Exodus 25 and verse 9. You don't have to look it up, but you know what he mentions? The ark. I want you to make an ark of gopher wood. Before he mentioned anything else, that was the first thing he mentioned. And we get asked why. Because the Lord always works from the inside out. Think again, whenever Ezra returned to rebuild the temple, they were going to lay the foundations and, and, and uh, raise up the edifice. You know the first thing they did? They repaired the altar. It's not amazing? Go and rebuild the temple, Ezra. Go and put the foundations in. Yes, Lord. Whenever they got there, what's the first thing they did? They repaired the altar. Because, folks, that's the way God works. God always begins in the inside. He begins in a man's heart. He begins in a woman's heart. Now, now let me contrast that. I think of false religion. We we get asked the question of false religion. How can a man be saved? And, of course, their answer is by good works. 
by, by ritual, by ceremony, by, by, by privileges. Think of the Hindus. They go and bathe in the river Ganges to wash away their sins. A dirty, filthy place. Uh, think of the Roman Catholics. They have their pilgrimages to Lourdes uh, and their pilgrimage to Croke Park and their pilgrimage to, to Fatma in Portugal. Uh, and they believe that going on a pilgrimage and paying, uh, doing penance and paying money into the, 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 um, uh, the chapel, they can earn their salvation. Think of the Muslims and their five pillars, one of them being a pilgrimage to Mecca. Think of the Nepalese people. It's interesting that they slaughtered 300,000 bullocks to appease one of their female gods, because they have many gods. They're, 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 they're polytheistic. That is, they worship many gods. In other words, if we could ask them as well, well, how to be saved, good works, ritual, pilgrimages, ceremonies, well, how can you be holy? And it's the same answer. Conform to a set of rules that will make you holy. Bow this way. Um, pray in this fashion. Hold up your hands in a certain way. Dress in a certain way. And it all makes you holy. You see, that's what false religion is. False religion is always an emphasis on the outward. And what you can do. But God's emphasis is always in the inward. God always starts in the inward. Because remember, you can't merit and earn salvation. Salvation is by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. And once you're saved, and once you come to Jesus Christ and trust in his finished work, and you're uh, legally justified, that is legally declared righteous, instantaneously complete and irresistible, and you're adopted into God's family and become one of his children, you're set apart to be the Lord's. And you're separated unto him from the world. And you're consecrated to him. Think of Lydia. We read in Acts 16 how the Lord opened her heart. Notice, he opened her heart first. Her, her heart was operated on. Her heart was affected in, in her inner being. And, and the outward then all flowed from it. You see, our sanctification brings about a moral and spiritual change in a person that begins in the insight, begins in the heart. It begins, as I've tried to say, at the new birth. Because in the new birth, there's the infusion of this principle of a new life, the life of God put in the soul. And the new birth introduces us to that new principle. It begins at the moment of new birth. And it's misleading then to say, well, you could be saved this day and 10 years from now or 20 years later, you could reach the point where you're entirely sanctified. See, once you're saved, this principle begins. Your inner man's affected and changed. And then it also manifests itself in the outer man to your body. The experience of sanctification. Notice quickly, and I'll have to be quick, the extent of the believer's sanctification. If you go back to the word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and then link it in with the words, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. In other words, every part of your being. Let me just point out the foundation for this work. You see, this process of sanctification that affects the whole of the entire person rests in the finished work of Christ. It's all of God's grace. It's really all because of Mount Calvary. The entire man is sanctified because Jesus died for that particular purpose. And his redemptive work on the cross was in order to sanctify us in the whole of our being. Now, note the link. And I'll just have to sort of throw this out at you. Note the link, the very God of peace. And why did he introduce that? It's only mentioned seven times in the Bible. The God who's satisfied. The God who's been appeased. And how has God appeased and what ground? On the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let, let, let me link this up with the book of Hebrews. You just turn uh, in the minutes that we have left to Hebrews chapter 12. 
and look with me at Sorry, it's Hebrews chapter 10. Sorry, it's chapter 9. I wrote the wrong reference down. I do apologize. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Christ died for this purpose in order to sanctify every believer in the whole of her being. And sanctification, of course, is designed to equip us to, to live in heaven. <laughs> equip us to enjoy heaven, to, to experience heaven. Sanctification is really part and parcel of being made fit to go to heaven. You see, as we are now, we couldn't go and enjoy heaven. Because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of change that needs to take place in our spirit and in our bodies. And you see, that's the difference again of justification. Justification gives us the entitlement, the right to go to heaven. But, but, but sanctification, it um, uh, not only entitles us to go to heaven, but, but sanctification is, is all about the engagement of heaven. Bringing about the complete and moral transformation, the spiritual transformation of our lives. Doesn't the Bible say in Revelation 21 and 27, none that defileth shall enter in. And the truth is, we still have moral and spiritual defilements. We still experience corruptions in our spirit and in our body. And sanctification is in order to have a fitness so that we can enter into heaven. Now let me just uh, prove that. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12 and um, uh, look with me there. And chapter 12 and... Um, the Bible here talks about uh, the, the spirits of just men made perfect in verse 23 to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Notice the words, the spirit of just men made perfect. And of course that's a death and this the catechism again teaches us the soul of believers are made perfect at death. Uh, because, you see, our spirits are, are not perfect. And there has to be the fitness of the spirit and, and the soul uh, to enter into heaven. There also has to be the fitness of the body. Uh, turn over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look with me. This is a, a very special portion of scripture. It deserves a lot of study and a lot of thought. 1 Corinthians 15 and come with me to the verse 55. Maybe we should link it up, go back to verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's a reference to the body, isn't it? Flesh and blood. He's talking about the body of believers. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The word sleep there means we'll not all die. But note the words, we should all be changed. When? In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. See, these bodies of ours, they're subject to mortality, aren't they? These bodies of ours are subject to corruption, for we still sin in our bodies, although not willfully. But here's the teaching. Our bodies have to be changed. 
And when will it be? In a moment. Less than a millisecond. In a flash. And because we're in Christ. And because we're saved and we experienced a new birth. And, 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 and we're in a relationship with the God of peace. On the basis that God is at peace, God is satisfied and appeased, and his wrath has been put away. On that very basis, our bodies are going to be changed. This is why Christ died. Notice one final reference uh, on this point. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. He says, now you maybe have not heard or thought about some of these things before. But look again. Verse 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Note the words, make you perfect. And again, it's through Jesus Christ and the blood of the everlasting covenant. And you see, We'll never be a perfect or sanctified apart from the cross work of Christ. And our spirits will never be made perfect apart from the cross work of Christ. And our bodies will never be made perfect through, uh, apart from the cross work of Christ. And let me just emphasize that Jesus Christ did die to, to save our bodies. Doesn't the Bible talk there in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8 and in the verse um, 23, it says... And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, waiting to, for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies. That's the moment when our bodies will be changed and transformed and given a glorious body like Christ. And our bodies will be free from mortality and they'll be free from corruption forever. And in a moment, they'll be like Christ. There's the foundation for the work. Think as we finish the fullness of this work. It mentions body. How do we use our bodies today? What's our appetites for our body? How do we appear in the presence of others? What about the eyes of our body? What do we look at? The old Puritans used to say that the eyes is a window into the state of the soul. What about our tongue? You know, you can be dressed the right way. You, you, you can um, appear to be nice and moral and yet have a raging fire in your mouth because your tongue's out of control. How do we use our bodies where we go? Uh, many Christians today, sadly, feel they can go to the, the pub and, and they can go into the dance hall and, and, the, and the nightclub. And I, I think that, you know, whenever believers do that, are they not sending out a message? And have they not got a conscience? And is it not possible that they're causing others to stumble? And is it not cause uh, to, to, to bring blight and blasphemy to the name of Jesus? See, where do we go with our bodies? How do we use our bodies? It's all tied in here. Because the Bible says, as we finish, we're to glorify God with your body. Turn lastly to that final reference there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And look with me at verse 19. We could go into the whole context here, but we'll not. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, they belong to him. He purchased them with his precious blood. And you can't therefore do what you like. You can't go what you like. You, you, you can't watch what you like. You, you, you have to think, is this glorifying to the Lord? Because that's the principle. Therefore glorify God in your body. And that's our chief end. That's our aim. And, th and that's the principle. Our bodies are for the Lord. Because he has bought them. And, and therefore there has to be a fullness about this work. It's not only our spirit that needs to perfect it. 
but our bodies. And, and therefore, as we live out our lives in the bodies, how we use them, our appetites, our appearance, our conduct, must use this principle. Is it glorifying to the Lord? Is it right? Is it proper? And of course, you've got to think not only of the foundation of the work, the fullness of the work, but think of the focus of the work. It's until Jesus comes. Remember how we finished last Lord's Day, giving you a reference or a thought about the Reverend Paul Finch, his father, an old holiness preacher, an Arminian, but that never bothered me. He loved the Lord and he, he, he left his life in light of Christ's coming. Every day he was watching and waiting. And every day he worked and I worshipped in the thought, Jesus is coming. And Jesus Christ will come back in the fullness of time. I don't know when that is. He, he will come when all things have been fulfilled to receive his people home. And we should be watching and waiting for him. And that should be our focus. And as we think of him coming, we want to be ready. And we want to make sure that our spirit is under the control of the Holy Spirit. And we want to make sure that our bodies are clean to the glory of God. May the Lord take these.